This is Dr. Robin Renwick. He is a PhD. He has like six PhDs. He is the smartest man on the planet. So if you have any questions about anything, please refer them to him. I'm obviously joking. He does have one PhD. Though. You can ask him about that later. He's going to be talking with, to us, with us today about perspectives of privacy. So um, he, he made the firmware of the badges. So let's give him a snap. Everyone snap. There we go. <laughs> Um, Robin, what perspectives on privacy do you have for us today? Well, he's going to share them with us right now. Oh, they're private. Oh, just take the microphone. Okay. okay. Can everyone hear me? Those who control the code control the rules. How different perspectives of privacy are being written into the code of blockchain systems. That's the title of a research paper that is um, currently up for peer review with the Journal of Information Technology. It was the culmination of about um, nine months' work, and it was conducted at University College Cork in Ireland. Um, Monero essentially was a case study. It was probably um, the best place to start to get informed, rational, and educated opinions on the relationship between privacy and blockchain systems. Um, however, that also means that everybody involved in the interview process was essentially a guinea pig. Um, putting all that aside, um, the project attempted uh, to obtain opinions and perspectives from an array of participants in the blockchain space. And I wanted to concentrate mainly on Monero as privacy is obviously a very strong thematic concern to the community, but those interviews interviewed were actively engaged in building a privacy-focused uh, system or ecosystem. Um, what I really wanted to try and do was to understand how notions of privacy informed their interaction with the technology and also how it informed their view of how the technology and industry should develop as a whole. And then I compared these opinions with those drawn from outside of the community. Really, the goal was to try and understand the differences, the similarities, the points of contention between all the perspectives. The study was um, analytically framed by boundary theory, which includes the concept of boundary objects. Now, a boundary object can be anything. Um, it can be a physical object, it can be an abstract philosophical concept, it can be, even be a linguistic um, term. Um, the frame is really nothing more than a lens to help understand the way in which um, people uh, negotiate varied interactions, differences of opinion, differences of perspectives as they engage in a cooperative design process. In the academic literature, a boundary object is described as an abstract or physical artifact existing in the liminal spaces between adjacent communities of people or alternatively, as things that exist as junctures where varied social worlds meet in areas of mutual concern. It emerged from the work of two design science researchers about 30 years ago, 30 years ago as they studied the design, development, and construction of a museum of vertebrate uh, zoology in Berkeley, California. Um, in that instance, the museum was the boundary object, um, and they felt that framing the object as one which crosses between and through boundaries helps understand the object itself, the process, the project as a whole, and the involved entities in better detail. Now, since the methodology emerged, there have been a wealth of studies that have used um, the theoretical framing. Uh, for example, uh, resilience, medicine, uh, water, room and space, um, gender, uh, even musical scores have all been studied through the boundary theory lens as boundary objects. Now in the context of um, blockchain technology, I imagine there to be various social worlds acting adjacently to each other as they try to move the technology forward. So I split the blockchain community into five main social worlds, and those are users, developers, cryptographic researchers, corporate architects, and then regulators and legislators. I then went about interviewing um, the social worlds, framing the responses under three main boundary uh, theory-related constructs. So these were concepts or ideas, resources or tools, and then finally methods and practices. So the perspectives were then analyzed, grouped, and framed. And they were understood to be either 
robust and convergent, so consistent across groups, plastic and complacent, so uh, varied or divergent across groups but harmless, and then plastic and internecine, which means uh, divergent across groups and harmful. So before I turn to what the outcomes or the findings of the study are um, or were, it's important to note um, that really the findings are limited to just this study. It was really just uh, exploratory in nature to undercover or to uncover some themes through which um, more deeper or wider studies could then be conducted. So if we're looking at the concepts construct, there were three main frames that emerged and they emerged quite organically from the interview and codification process. So these were the right to privacy, which was robust, this idea of a decentralized revolution, which was also robust, and then this idea of the role or the mode of uh, government involvement in this decentralized revolution. And, and this was plastic and into Nissan. All groups agreed with the right to privacy, whether that was financial or uh, informational. All groups also agreed that blockchain was affording a decentralized revolution and it was being created in this era. However, there were some concrete divergences with respect to the role of government in this revolution and their level of involvement in the development of the technology. Now, the varying perspectives may be attributed partly to the multi-purpose affordances of blockchain technology. So, on the one hand, uh, we know that blockchain offers market-led efficiencies in the creating, the storing, and the securing of data, whether that's financial or otherwise, and on the other, it affords a radically different system of value exchange for which no central authority has control. Now, separating the affordances does not actually appear straightforward, and neither does it appear to be a priority um, for many of the individuals participating in the actual development of the technologies. Whatever the outcome, um, the use of the technology will probably not fulfill the expectations of some social world, i.e. there will always be disagreement about what the technology should or shouldn't do. If we look at it a, bit, a bit more closely, you can see how uh, the right to privacy and decentralized uh, revolution were both um, robust frames. Um, However, if you look at the last one, which is the role and the mode of government involvement, you can see that there are divergences of opinion. Now, I'm going to paraphrase a lot what has been said. Um, there's a lot more detail in the actual paper, but I'm just going to take quite broad strokes um, regarding um, what was said in the interviews. So, for example, users do not want government involvement as they might see the decentralized blockchain-based systems as a method for freeing themselves from government control. Developers do not necessarily want government involvement as they see themselves developing cypherpunk-inspired systems that are replacing law with apolitical code. Corporate architects do not want government involvement as they feel it will stifle innovation and perhaps harm profits. Regulators obviously do want to be involved, but they aren't completely sure how to negotiate their involvement due to the multiple affordances of the systems. If we turn to methods and practices, things become extremely nuanced and a lot more delicately poised. So blockchain systems um, are seen by all as a method through which ordinary transactions may be overseen. After all, we're talking about open permissionless data silos or ledgers. We all know the inherent characteristics of these systems. They're transparent, they're audible, they're immutable, et cetera, et cetera. However, Perspective differs with respect to who needs to be overseen, who is watching, and who needs to be kept in check. The source of perceived threats becomes the point of cont contention rather than any divergence of the technology's affordance. So for example, users may feel that governments need to be kept in check. Um, Developers may feel that corporations need to be kept in check, and regulators may feel that both users and corporations need to be kept in check. This brings us on to the idea of extraordinary transactions, and whether or not blockchain systems can be a method um, or can afford a, a, a method for overseeing these types of transactions. Obviously, regulators are concerned with some of the privacy affordances of the system, and they're keen to be able to access information for quote-unquote dirty or tainted transactions. However, other groups, 
feel that affording this sort of access potentially affects the privacy aspects of the network or system as a whole. Now, whether or not it's possible to create systems that allow for optional transparency that will appease all social worlds is still an unknown. The regulation doesn't exist, so it's difficult to know exactly what is required and from whom. However, regulators do seem to assume that methods are necessary to avoid widespread near effortless money laundering, and that these methods will be built into the protocol consensus layer once it becomes law on the legislative or the regulatory layer. They assume the blockchain systems will automatically code in compliance once the legislation is set. Now, we know that changing the consensus layer code is not an easy task, especially if the pressure is coming from outside the community as opposed to from the inside of the community. There's no obvious middle ground presented here, and there's, that's, there's no discernible path to reconciliation. If we look at it a bit more closely, um, you can see the robust agreement on blockchain as a method for overseeing ordinary transactions. You can also see the differences of opinion with respect to the second frame, which is blockchain as a system for overseeing extraordinary transactions. So the divergence surrounds the idea of, of, of tainted or dirty transactions. Now it's important to note that most of the social worlds would prefer not to see two-tier privacy affordances develop, and they, but they also understand the necessity for privacy technologies to be deployed in order to enact a fungible currency, and this is especially pertinent in the case of Monero. They want to protect certain rights or believe in protection from authoritarian regimes, protection from the surveillance state, from surveillance capitalism, believe in civil liberties, etc. Corporate architects um, understand for the most part that they must comply with whatever the regulations demand, but they also understand the importance of private transactions in their business dealings, along with the obvious need for a fungible currency. And on the other hand, regulators are wary of privacy affordances and wish to have methods for overseeing tainted transactions, full stop. There is no convergence of perspectives. Now we're starting to see regulatory pressure being placed on the economic layer. At some point, in my opinion, it's only a matter of time before that pressure moves down to the network or the consensus layer, or the protocol and consensus layer, I should say. So I'm gonna summarize. There's two high level findings that emerge from the study. The first is that significant divergences are apparent with respect to the desired level and mode of government involvement in the development of blockchain systems. The social worlds are in agreement that near-term government involvement is undesirable and regulators are operating under the assumption they may join the development at a later stage when necessary restrictions have been identified. The second high-level finding relates to the idea of a method for overseeing extraordinary transactions. Regulators believe that compliance will be coded in once it's required. However, other social worlds are operating under the assumption that the trade-off has already been made regarding privacy affordances to accommodate the essential mechanics of privacy-enabling blockchain systems. Okay, that is essentially it. The research uh, paper is in for peer review. Um, it's about a 50-page paper, so it's quite dense. There's a lot have been said by many of the participants. Um, I'm not sure how long it's going to take. Um, personally, I would like to see an abridged version for uh, the MRL. However, I'm not so sure that a soft science um, study is in their uh, scope or their reason d'etre. Um, however, the actual interviews, especially ones from the Monero community, are an extremely interesting read. Um, and they're actually, personally, I think they're quite beautiful. They are wide-ranging, they're informed, they're educated, they're wise, they're rational. It's, some, it's sometimes very, very emotive. Um, and when I was reading them and analyzing them, I often imagined that it would be nice to see a small little book, a Perspectives of Privacy book, as told by the Monero community, um, which would be interviews surrounding their understanding or their perspectives on the relationship between privacy and blockchain systems and cryptocurrencies. Um, out of those th three things, um, I'm not sure how many of them will come off. I'm hoping number one is just a matter of going through the peer review process. 
Uh, number two, it's not really up to me, it's up to MRL. Um, and number three, um, yeah, it could potentially be funded by a CCS. Um, of course, that would also be up to the people who are interviewed, um, whether or not they'd be willing to publish their interviews in an anonymous fashion. Um, that's pretty much the presentation, so I'll take uh, any questions uh, if you have them. Yep. Uh, yes and no. Uh, some regulators seem to understand that there would be conflict of interest between some jurisdictions. Some um, just talked at a very broad, high-level overview. What I did get a sense was that they believed um, that the, the, the legislature had was already there. It just needed to be amended and reworked to be able to include some of the technologies that we're now developing. The problem with changing legislature or legislation is that it takes quite a lot of time and obviously there's a process of understanding that needs to be done before that can actually happen. Um, I did get a sense that there was a very wide degree of uh, knowledge difference depending on who you talk to um, and that kind of confused uh, some matters uh, with regards to the an uh, analysis of the interviews. Yep. yep. Do you know that there wasn't? Um, a lot of the views um, were quote unquote quite soft, um, which was actually quite surprising. I think the people that I talked to, um, it, it didn't seem like it was very adversarial because they believed that the rules and regulations were already in place. Um, for argument's sake, in the PSD in Europe, uh, the Payment Services Directive, that that's already there and that covers uh, payments between people. Um, some of the other regulators, um, depending on their jurisdiction, talked of other um, published legislature with the, what was already in place that covered a lot of the actual interactions that it was dealing with. But I, I didn't get a sense that it was highly adversarial. I think I, there was a strong sense that people were willing to learn and educate themselves and then mold the existing rules around what technology was developing. Yep. Yeah. So kind of jurisdictional uh, censorship in, in such way. Wow. So you you would get you would get a number of parallel chains that are each uh, agreeing by the terms within their jurisdiction. Well, in terms of the actual code change, I, I'm not sure. I'm not a developer. I'm not involved in those decisions, so I'm not sure um, how much code needs to be changed. I'm also not sure the regulations are there, so we don't really know. Um, do I think it will cause a significant amount of problems? Uh, yeah, I think so. But it also depends where the pressure comes from. The governments may place a lot of pressure on the economic layer, and then they, they might be the ones um, that have, are kind of uh, afforded the responsibility of putting the pressure on the protocol and consensus layer, which actually worries me a bit more because a lot of the people operating on the economic layer um, are intertwined in the space a bit deeper, so it might be harder to distinguish who's a, a, a good actor, uh, for lack of better terms. Yes? Yeah, I mean, this depends on your perspective. Um, it was really difficult to make a, a classification between one and the other. Um, there was just this idea of, um, how shall I say, transactions that would need to be investigated for some uh, reason. Um, what these reasons are, we kind of know. It's money laundering, terrorist financing, um, tax evasion. That's pretty much the big three. Um, I didn't want to make a lot of kind of sub uh, frames regarding all these different transactions because all, all three of those have different uh, problems associated with them. So it's just easier to keep uh, the subframes quite broad and just keep it at extraordinary and ordinary. The distinction between them depends on who is actually viewing the transaction. Um, that's the sense I got. Um, 
I think it's important to remember that this really was just an exploratory study. So really just wanted to uncover some themes that would then be really uh, put into a wider, a deeper study and to really to drill down into it, what actually is going on. Um, but that would take time and resources. So anybody else? Am I done? Great. Thank you very much.